Hi, my name is Jacob. My life hadn't gone the way I had expected it to, or rather my future hadn't been what I'd hoped. When I was in college, my whole life revolved around school and work. If I wasn't on the computer writing some program, I was in class or tutoring. If I wasn't doing any of those things, I was helping out at the help desk of our school. Either way, I had no life outside of class and work. Mainly because I had told myself that I would focus on the fun parts of my life when I had a degree in a decent paying job. Right now, I needed to earn all of that. When school finally ended, I was in a panic to get a decent job because I knew, not soon after, Uncle Sam would come calling for me to pay back all of the student loans I had taken out. Suffice to say that I wasn't being very picky and I really just applied for anything that paid a decent amount of money. I didn't even care if it was related to my computer science major, just said it would pay the bills. I finally found a job with a small web development company that seemed to be the big dream I was hoping for. It paid great, my coworkers were excellent, my hours were flexible, and the work was fun enough. There was an itch in the back of my mind that I couldn't quite scratch though. Was this it? Was this the life I had given up in my early 20s for? I got up in the morning and I worked out. I'd get dressed and I'd go to work. Then for 8 or more hours I would work on different code banks and polish up different websites. Before sloughing off back to my new apartment to eat, sleep, and do it all over again. I tried going out with friends, going to the bars and parties, taking walks, all the things you were supposed to do with a normal life, but none of it brought any excitement to me. I started taking inordinate risks when I was driving, caring less about how people perceived me when I talked with them and ignoring my friends and family. You have to understand some things about me to really know what I was going through. For the better part of my life, I had been regarded as a pretty strange kid. I was interested in the moral cult and obscure parts of life. I didn't really care much for rules. I liked stealing from others and breaking into houses of my youth, and lying like a second nature. As I entered my teenage years, I realized quickly that I couldn't get away with these things anymore if I wanted to get ahead and I decided to change a lot about myself. In essence, I learned to wear a mask and I got so good at it that I seemingly forgot I had been wearing it for all these years. I would even fooled myself. With the boredom and mediocrity of life after college settling in, my mask was starting to wear loose and the creature from my youth was peeking out from behind it. I started frantically looking for things to satiate my growing need for thrill and excitement and my numbness to social norms grew even more deafening. Working in computers, I had heard of and used Tor on many occasions, the browser used to access the deep web, but I had never been interested in anything that it provided. At most, it masked your identity and sacrificed speed, but at worst, it was where the dredge of society lurked and for all my social ineptitude, I knew I wasn't like any of those people. On my way home from work one day, I was driving down the freeway as normal, but suddenly a guy cut me off and dodged in front of me, almost causing me to crash. I slammed on my brakes and turned my steering wheel as hard as I could, causing me to run off the side of the road into a ditch. My brakes and wheels no doubt took some heavy damage, but in general, my car was okay. The whole experience made my heart beat again like I was young. And instead of being mad, I remember I was almost excited by the thrill of it all. That's when it occurred to me that I may have a use for the deep web after all. Like I said, it was where you could find all the dregs of society and while I sure I wasn't one, perhaps I needed someone who was willing to stoop to that level. When I got home, I downloaded Tor and started researching different anonymous forums where I might be able to score a little action. To the more experienced users of the dark web, I likely came off as a newbie going around poking his head into places that he knew nothing about. But I didn't care, all I really needed was for just one person to be interested in guiding me through the gates of this underworld. 
I posted a little thread here and there on any open forum I could find. Looking for an adventure and something that would get my heart pumping like I'm alive again. I provided a recently set up email and waited to see if I got any replies. Many of my threads were taken down by moderators and those that weren't found unsolicited spam, obvious virus links or disgusting images sent to my email that I provided. After a few days of no success, I learned of a few chat rooms that I believe might be more helpful with my search. These would be live conversations so I wouldn't have to wait for replies and they would hopefully be more welcoming to someone who didn't know a lot about this kind of thing. After posting my normal, looking for an adventure, most of the rooms booted me, either as a newbie or believing that I was a cop. But in my very last one, I received a pop-up to talk with one of the chat members privately, which I was more than happy to do. There I was, at my desk, nothing lighting the room but my computer monitor. Sitting in the darkness, I chatted back and forth with the guy about my life and how I wanted something more interesting, risky, and fun. He said he'd met many people who'd stumbled onto this chat looking for the same thing and that he always liked helping them out. We talked for days about the different adventures he'd taken his past acquaintances on, but each of them always wanted to return to their normal dull lives after a bit, which left him to continue his search for that one buddy who wouldn't leave. In a whole, this sounded incredibly sad and stalkerish, which, believe it or not, didn't frighten me away, but left me more interested. I'm not naive or stupid, I was talking with someone I'd met on a random dark web chat room. At the most harmless, it was some old fat guy sitting on the other end spinning me a web of lies. But at most, it really was someone dangerous and I wanted to find out for myself. I wanted him to be dangerous because therein lies the thrill, which was my vendetta from the beginning of this little adventure into the dark web. I got up the courage to ask him if he'd ever want to actually meet and go on one of his little trips just to see what his reaction would be, and of course he was more than happy. I learned that he was only about 7 hours away from me, so I suggested that we meet the next week and that I didn't want to know any of the details, just that I wanted to have a fun time for a few days. The days passed by quickly and the night before I was planning on making the trip, I packed up all the things that I might need clothes and travel stuff, but also a few self-defense items, a flashlight, and several burner phones. Loading it all in my truck, I started to get a rush then and there of what I was about to do. I was meeting up with a complete stranger in the middle of the night, putting myself in danger, and I had no idea what the morning hours were going to bring. As I drove down the dark highway road, my lights beaming in front of me, I felt as alive as ever. The dull, drudgery of my job, the boring routine of my life, it all just slipped away. Night and the passing cars gave a kind of quiet and peace to my racing mind. When I got to the town of my new friend's address, I really started to feel the excitement wash over me. I had given him the number to one of my burner phones and he had texted me, Are you almost here? I didn't reply as I knew I was and pulling over would just have taken more time. I winded up a road near the edge of town, but definitely removed from public and prying eyes until I saw his house in the distance. Pulling into the driveway, the reality of what I was doing started to hit me and, more than excited, I began to feel scared. My car lights shone strong against a large metallic garage door and I had seen a shadow move across the bay windows of what looked to be a living room. I received another text, come on in, the door is unlocked, it said. I took a deep gulp and opened my car door. The beeping startled me as I had forgotten to turn off the engine. Pulling the keys out, I put a few between my knuckles and stepped out of the seat under the dirt, shutting the door behind me. My heart was racing and my breath getting more labored. Every instinct I had was telling me to turn around and I looked back at my car but I just kept moving forward. I heard every footstep I took in the dark night air and I slowly reached out to turn the handle on the old door, cracked paint, funneling down it and a rusty handle. Inside the garage a large white light hung from a cord in the center over two pickup trucks muddled and rusted from head to toe. 
The place was very cluttered and I had to step along a narrow path until I reached a screen door just above a few steps. I kind of whispered to myself, you can just turn around and just go back. But my adventurous and apathetic nature took over and I took a few steps up and through the screen door as it squealed shut. Inside, the house looked fairly normal and I started to say, Hello? Into the room, is anyone there? I didn't hear anything. I said it a few more times and I started to walk forward into the living room I would mentioned before. I'm downstairs, just fixing the water heater, I heard come from behind me. There's a wrench on the table, would you mind bringing it to me? I sure as hell wasn't going to do that. I wanted an adventure, but I wasn't going to willingly walk into god knows what kind of trap in a completely locked off downstairs room. All those instincts that I could have been listening to from the get go came roaring back to my attention as I immediately turned around to get the heck out of there. Running up to the door, I turned the handle, but it refused to open. I started panicking and I turned it so hard that I broke it off the door. Just then, I started to hear the creaking like something coming up the stairs and my heart didn't race. It just stopped and calmed down. I turned around and I remember the wrench sitting on the kitchen table. I picked the heavy thing up and prepared to fly my way out if I needed to. Those giant bay windows were another way out of this house. Quick like lightning, I ran past the door to the stairs where the voice and creaking came from and slammed the door shut as I did. I hopped onto the couch and bashed the windows with the wrench climbing through the broken shards of glass. Climbing into my car as if there wasn't a tomorrow, I shoved the keys in the ignition and screeched out of the driveway, laying my foot onto the paddle as hard as I could. After hours of berating myself on the long trip home, the sun was starting to come up and I felt some twinge of relief come over me. I was so tired from the whole night of events and after, slinking into my apartment and out of my clothes, I crawled into bed. I didn't even forget any of this craziness that had ever happened. I closed my eyes and I drifted off to sleep. A few hours later, I woke up to the beeping on my computer, meaning I had a new message. I went over to the computer and saw that it was from my now former, never to actually meet, acquaintance. It read, Why did you leave? We'd have had so much fun. I didn't reply, I just looked at the message and considered what my next move should have been at this point. Another message came to the screen which left me shaken and cold. Your apartment looks so boring compared to what I had in store. My webcam wasn't on, so how on earth did he know what my apartment looked like? How the heck did he even know where I was? How did he... That was the last thing Jacob told me before meeting a rather unfortunate accident. My basement really was much nicer than his apartment and I was so sad to see he couldn't have stayed for long. All my friends always seemed to leave me. I guess I'll just have to find another. Tell me, have you ever thought of going on the dark web? I know somewhere you might like. It all started with me deciding to browse the deep web that one night. Look, before you judge me, not everybody who roams the deep web are psychopaths that hire assassins and sell weed online. It has many uses and it is different from the dark web, which is where there are psychopaths that hire assassins and sell drugs. Why was I using the deep web? Well, privacy curiosity and piracy besides it is off the point what I'm trying to say is the deep web is mostly harmless and you don't really encounter stuff like what I encountered there is a dot tour site a deep website 
that takes you to a random tour site. Kind of like a search engine with only the I feel lucky part. Not knowing what you're going to get is exciting and it's actually entertaining. For example, I've been to too many sites that discuss exotic conspiracy theories like lizard people and aliens. See, most of the time you get to a place where crazy people argue about crazy stuff. In one of them, two users were in a heated argument about the color of aliens. Are they gray or are they pale blue? One commenter said, Sure, idiot. They're from Sirius and they're long pale blue idiots. The hell are you talking about? Aliens as we know are from Mars and there are pictures of them and old videos showing dissection of one. Aliens are gray and there's proof. Idiot, those are fake. Real aliens are far away, not Mars. And so on. And the choppy comments. You get the point, right? There were some odd and interesting ones that I want to share with you people. For example, there is one for real life treasure hunts. Where people would hide something valuable and others would try to figure out where. Their efforts and the lengths they've gone through to decipher stuff is amazing. And I would go to that site every once in a while. Once, somebody shared a semi-hard treasure hunt with a surprise treasure. And people got to solve it. Once they did, they found a body. I'm serious. The one that had found the body called the police and they showed them the website to tell them how he had found it. The site was disabled for a few days until one of the creators helped police find the murderer. After the murderer did get caught, the site was back on, but with an added policy of showing the treasure to the mods before posting. And there was another one which seemed like a typical conspiracy theory site to me at first. It was about a man who they called The Collector. According to them, he was an immortal time traveler or something, and he appeared in many places during important events, collecting data, hence the name. The owner of the site claimed that he was now a billionaire living in the shadows, still collecting or something. He wasn't quite sure of any of it though, saying that, although he appears constantly throughout history, he never really does anything much. Not that I nor my fellow researchers know of at least. He continued in his next message, stating that. But this doesn't mean that he won't ever do anything. In the end, he is an immortal time traveler that collects data and you can't trust somebody as such. Especially when they're a billionaire. As again, I thought that it was a funny conspiracy theory at first. But then I saw him looking at me from the street after I... Actually, no. I will come to that part in time. First, how I messed up to this degree. The dot tour site that brings people to a random tour site this time ended up taking me to a discussion site in which people talk about their favorite tour sites. Which was fine by me. New sites are always good. One of the hot topics was the search engine I was using to get to random sites. People that were supportive towards the engine I was using, saying that it was an ultimate gamble. However, there was an anonymous user that suggested another tourist site with the same purpose, saying, Guys, it's cool and all, but it only searches through normal tourist sites. It's kind of lame, so use this instead. This one has an even bigger pool of websites and it's not for normal ones only. You'll not regret it, I swear. His phrasing wasn't to my liking. It felt a little weird. But knowing that it was only 11.07 and I was getting bored, I decided to give it a try. Like a freaking idiot. I don't want to get into too much detail about this site because I don't want anybody snooping around and finding it out. So the only thing I want to tell is that it was black with a red, find new site button on it. I made sure that it wasn't a shady download link, and I clicked it. 
The first site it took me to was one with red writings and probably an Asian language that I didn't understand. It had symbols and pictures of dragons in it. It was weird, but not so weird. I closed the site and I clicked the red button again. This time, it was Arabic. It had pictures of swords and new moon. I was getting bored of it. And then I found out that they had an English version that they would link right at the bottom of the page. I clicked it and I saw that it was a page calling people to jihad. I looked around a little and I closed it when I was bored of it. On the next page I opened was nothing at all, except for a small little red circle in the middle. I clicked it and a fart noise came out. Annoyed, I closed it. Red button again. This time, I saw a woman crying. And then a man came holding something in. Actually, I don't want to share this part. In the end, I was disgusted and horrified. I decided not to use the red button again. I mean, I thought finding new weird things would have been entertaining, not creepy like that. But the things that I had found were different and to find something similar to those felt exciting. My heart was beating a little faster with the adrenaline. I knew that I had to click it again. Who knew what I would see? Illegal drugs, guns, cannibalism. I clicked. God damn it, I clicked it. The page that it brought me to was not okay. It had nothing, no name. The URL just read .tor and it had a video with the circular play button in the middle. Instead of saying, what the hell is this, and closing the site for good, I decided to watch the video, and so I did. The video was black and white, showing a billiards table. There was only a ball visible on the left side of the screen, and then a gloved hand put the white ball on the right and hit it, making it go towards the other ball. It was in slow motion. The white ball started rolling towards the other ball and when it hit the ball, instead of a force acting upon the ball and making it go left, both of them started to roll right, together. It didn't look edited. It looked real, but in a weird way. That made me feel uneasy, like everything I knew was shaken. It's a hard feeling to describe. That video made me a little bit sick too. I turned on the lights and I decided to walk around a little in my room. I looked out the window, so quiet and nice. Everything made enough sense. I touched my left hand with my right hand. Real and the hands acted the way they should. That video had something surreal, but shown on reality. On reality and reality. I turned back to my bed where I was lying down with my laptop before. The video was over anyway. I would close that site, the red button site too, and turn back to my previous random search engine. I turned the lights off and I got back to my bed. But instead of a reply option of any kind, the site had a button with next written on it. I didn't know what was next and it excited me. I clicked. I think I'm addicted to gambling. The next video started playing automatically. It was black and white again. There was a priest reading from the Bible. There is no sound but his lips were moving as he... Wait, I thought. Did he just turn the wrong page? Yes, he did. Instead of turning the page on the right to see the next two pages, he turned the left page and he started reading them from the bottom right. The video was on reverse. Weird, I thought. And then the video ended. Unsatisfied, I clicked next. The first thing that piqued my interest was a pentagram. This video was also black and white. I guess every video was black and white on this site. 
I murmured to myself. Anyway, there was a white pentagram on top of a dark table. A gloved hand came to the vision and it put a cockroach on the top of the table. The cockroach at first wandered around, doing nothing in particular except being disgusting like cockroaches always are. And then it had found the pentagram. It followed around the line to the bottom left corner of the pentagram. It stopped for a short while, and then it started walking around the lines of it. It walked the route necessary to draw the pentagram. Bottom left, up. Bottom right, upper left, upper right. Bottom left, up, and so on. It did this for a while as I watched it with excitement, and then something even weirder happened. The cockroach, as it reached the bottom left once again, kept walking but it did so in place without moving, like a mime. And then it started moonwalking like Michael Jackson to follow the reverse of its route. Bottom left, upper right, upper left, bottom right, up. It was disturbing and weird. This time it cut short. The video ended before the cockroach finished its first loop. Disturbed, disgusted, and shot. I still pressed next. This time it showed the priest again. He was reverse talking faster. He looked a little pale and in hurry. His nose was bleeding, only a little. As he turned the page, again the wrong page, I saw blood on his fingernail. The video ended. Next. There is a pentagram again. This video was shot from above like the other one. This time, however, there is a naked guy walking on the pentagram. I made the sound conclusion of this pentagram being bigger than the one I saw the roach walk in. And then I realized how unnecessary that thought was and I kept watching the video. Just like the cockroach, he followed the route normally at first and then in reverse afterwards. Yet it was a little different this time. Before he started walking backwards, he shook a little, looking just like my friend Jake, who got electrocuted while playing with the fence. It was odd as hell. The video ended with him completing some tours backwards, and then getting out of the pentagram to be replaced by another guy, who started walking the route just as the video ended. Next, I saw a naked woman with her back turned to the camera. Her dark hair was wavy and slightly messy, and she had an upside down cross tattoo on the upper left of her back. The video ended. I, a little bit more excited now, I click next. A man crying in a graveyard, crying in backwards. The video was taken from far away for some reason, and it being in black and white didn't help. But if you looked hard enough, you could see tears rising from the ground and getting into his eyes. They are only as big as pixels, but if you really look close enough and squint your eyes, you can. And then a black bird got to the view of the camera, flying backwards. It was always backwards. But my eyes gazed upon something awful. The woman from the previous video was walking towards the man. Even though the video was in reverse, she was walking straight towards the guy. As she got right next to him, the guy's eyes sucked the last of the tears that could and looked at her. The video ended right there. Holy shit. I detested. I click next again. And the priest was back. He was pale as a human could get. He was bleeding from both of his eyes and nostrils. The cross on his neck was, every once in a while, trying to rotate on its own. Every time this happened, the priest fixed it. Other than that, he was reading from the Bible in reverse like crazy. Even though the video was on silent, the movement of his mouth indicated him shouting like a madman. Every time he turned the page, his fingers got in frame. 
His nails were pouring blood. The video ended. The next button was visible again. What kind of demonic shit is this? I asked no one in general. It was scary and I was home alone. This was something that was not meant to be seen by somebody like me for sure. This was way above the insanity that I can endure without having nightmares for my entire life. Yet I clicked the button again. The next video made me regret it. The video was taken in a darkly colored room, with one light that is bright enough to show what was going on. It was black and white again, with a line of naked men. The video showed where they were headed, and to that lady, she was looking at the camera. This time I noticed even weirder things about her. She had pentagram tattoos on her left chest. She was wearing a sleep mask, the kind that has eyes of cut animals on it, but this one had goat eyes. So yeah, I thought, goat eyes in black and white, how creepy could it get? Boy, it got worse. The first in line was super excited, as I could tell by looking at his, you know. Well, she stopped looking at the camera turned to him and gave him a long kiss. First, he was happy about the kiss that he was receiving, but then he started shaking his arms uncomfortably, and when they finished it, he, uh, he started shaking like he was having a seizure on foot, and then he suddenly stopped, his body inhumanely arched back, like he was one of those weird running titans from Attack on Titans, and he kept on walking. I felt like throwing up, but I just kept watching. The same happened with another man on the line. He received the kiss, had a seizure, body arched back and kept walking. I noticed some other details as I kept on watching. For example, the guy's walking patterns had gotten the same after they got the kiss, even though they had been different before. Not only that, but their pupils expanded greatly just as they had received the kiss, making their eyes a horrifying dark afterwards. And yeah, one of the guys was the guy crying in the graveyard. The video stopped. I looked at the button very hard, very hard, not sure what to think or what to do. I clicked it. The priest was back, his Bible was soaked in blood, just as his eyes, nose, mouth, ears, literally everything and everywhere was soaked in it as well. He was this time, looking directly at the camera, angry, scared, pale. His cross was turning around and around without a care in the world. He shouted words to the camera. Every time he opened his mouth, blood gushed out. Yet he still seemed to be in reverse. He directed his pointing finger at the camera. He got soaked in blood. It was kind of funny for some reason. Almost like a weird finger water gun. Pointing your fingers at others to squirt water. You could see, despite the camera being covered in blood, him shouting more and more. Each time, more blood came out. Blood was gushing out of his ears, eyes, nose, mouth, even skin. At last, he erupted. His head exploded and what came out was, well you guessed it, more blood. Too much blood. Next. And I clicked it. A pile of the men, all dead in a white room. Black and white. Dilated pupils and in the pile. Something caught my eye, a tattoo on one of the men. It was familiar. Why? I looked at the man. It was my friend from college, William. William, how could I forget about him? I was so close to him and then he... Who was I thinking about? I said to myself out loud.
to refresh my memory. It didn't work. I looked at the man in the video again. William. It was William. But why and how could I have forgotten about him? In mere seconds, that is. I, in order to test this new and horrifying phenomenon, looked away while thinking of William. His face, our memories, and my thought of him all seemed to vanish in mere seconds. And when I tried to remember, it was like trying to catch a fog. I shivered and I looked at him again. I had to do something. I had to learn what happened to him, to William. William Jackson, yes. I searched him on social media sites and some other sites. Nothing. Weird. I tried to remember his relatives and I realized that I had forgotten his name again. I looked at the video again, which was still going, but nothing was happening on the video. William Jackson. His mother's name was... Maria, yes. Maria Jackson. I searched for Maria Jackson. I found her. I searched her profile to see if it was stupid enough to share her phone number in social media. Yes. I looked at the clock. 3.33. When did it become so late? I wondered. And then I entered her number, called her, and I waited on the line. To my surprise, she answered. Yes, she asked. Ma'am, do you know what time it is? I'm sorry, ma'am, but I've got a question to ask about. I looked at him on the video again, just to remember his name. Your son, William. She was silent for a long time. William. She started crying. My sweet William, why? A short pause. Her crying got worse. Why can't I remember my sweet William? I didn't know what to say, so I stood silent. Who is this? She asked after a long pause. And why am I crying? I'm sorry. She said, recovering from her cries. Did we talk about something? Jesus. I shouted and I threw my phone somewhere in fear. Because the naked woman was on the video. And she was looking directly at me. While watching the kiss theme video, I wondered how her eyes looked like under that goat eye shaped sleep mask. Well... She herself had goat eyes too, and she was looking directly at me. Not at the camera, but at me. With all this panic and fear and adrenaline inside, I still noticed the small detail that the video was no longer in black and white. It had color. She was right next to the bodies when I first saw her. I wanted to close the window, but there was no cursor for some reason. And as she started walking towards the, the camera, wait no, towards me, I noticed that I was unable to move, frozen in fear. She came closer and closer, until the entire screen was her head, with those eyes looking at me. She opened her mouth and her teeth were black. She said something in a language that I assume was in Latin. Her voice was horrifying and commanding and tempting in a way, as she was. Now, she looked better to me. I mean, she didn't look bad before, but now she was tempting. And I started to move towards her, to the screen, where she was waiting for me. What ended the trance was the buzzing sound of my phone, to inform me that either a message came or I was about to be murdered by that freak on the laptop. I quickly backed away. She was surprised by my reaction just as I was. I quickly grabbed the edge of my laptop to close it in. Okay, maybe you somehow managed to believe me in my story this far. And I appreciate it. 
but I can understand if you choose not to believe what happened next. I really do. Because you know what? I still can't believe how she, as I grabbed the side of my laptop, punched her freaking arm from the laptop screen and gripped my wrist. I cried out in fear and I tried to get free of her grip. She was strong, however, and so I did the first thing that came to my mind. I punched the screen with my free hand, hoping that it would get across and hit her in the face. I made contact, thank God. And then I was free, with my left hand still on the screen. I quickly pulled it out to see an angry gold lady looking at me and hissing through her black teeth. I screamed, and I threw the laptop to the corner of my room, and I noticed that it landed right in front of the door. I now thinking that getting out of the room was now impossible. I got to the corner of my room, still looking at the laptop and I tried to find something, anything. There were two pencils, one sharp and one broken, and a lamp. Shit, I thought to myself. And that is when she started crawling out of my laptop. And I noticed something, something that had a chance to work, if I was lucky enough. As she managed to climb out and get up, she looked at me with anger. And then her anger and her hisses suddenly stopped. It's working. I shouted both to her and to myself, and a little bit to God. As I was holding the cross I made by holding the two pencils vertically, I was happy to see that her angry and bloodthirsty mood quickly turned into... laughs. She started laughing. Oh, I thought. So that's why she doesn't look angry anymore. She plunged at me with inhuman strength, making me hit the wall behind me head first. Everything went dark for a short moment. I felt overwhelmingly dizzy as she grabbed me by the throat and pulled me towards herself. Fearing for my life, I tried to hit her with my hands. Instead, I ended up stabbing her in the cheek with a sharp pencil that I had. She backed away in pain. I needed to attack again. The lamp. I took it and I hit her with it, smashing the lamp on her head. She fell down in pain, randomly throwing around punches and kicks. Oh, and by the way, I noticed that she had goat feet too just then, and that is why I decided to hold my distance from her kicks. Instead, I threw random things at her that I had found in my room. A half full beer bottle from that night, and some books, a water bottle, and other stuff at my desk, a cigarette lighter, and even my pillow. Look, I don't know how it ended up this way, but I can tell you for certain that after a while of throwing things at her, by what I believe to be divine intervention, she started burning. Right in the middle of my room, screaming in Latin and in agony. I did not know what to do when for a second, I thought of using water to put out the fire for some reason, but that thought died quickly. And then I noticed that she was not burning and crying in between me and the door, and so I decided to get the hell out of there. I closed the door behind me, I found my baseball bat somewhere in the corridor, and I started waiting right in front of the door, listening to her screams. Half expecting her to open the door and start attacking me while she was still ablaze, but it didn't happen. Her screams faded into nothingness and I, with great courage, to open the door. No smoke, no burned naked lady, nothing. It was my room, a little messier than before, but still. As I looked around, I noticed something all of a sudden. I could now remember William. Somehow burning her must have brought his memory back. I looked around to make sure that no danger was left around and I started looking for her phone, just to talk to William's mother. I didn't really question why it was my priority. I really wasn't in a mindset to question anything. But then, when I saw the guy I mentioned before looking at me across the street, I lost my previous thought. He was doing nothing but looking at me. 
I looked back at him and I realized that he was the one from the collector website. Long and old, with glasses and a weird hat. Wait, I thought, forgetting the guy in a second, and what about the laptop? And with the fear of something similar to that naked lady coming out of my laptop again, I started looking around for it. It was on the floor and in good shape, but the screen was not in my view. And with great fear, I picked up the laptop and I looked at the screen. Next. It's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. Hide and seek. An old friend of mine emailed this to me a while back with the subject line, Hide and Seek. And I've been hesitant to post it for reasons that should become obvious as you read it. That said, I feel that enough time has gone by for this to be well, safe, so I'm going to post it here. The only edits I've made were swapping out names and formatting, otherwise it's all exactly as he sent it. T, if you're reading this, then message me. I want to know if you're alright, and if you are, I know you'll be looking for this story to show up. This is what the email said. Vigento. I'm writing this story because I feel like I need an outlet. I swear to God that you better actually check your email for once in your damn life. Please. As for if you actually are reading this, I want you to wait as long as your admittedly better judgment tells you to wait and then post this story online. I know it's a bit vain, but I want people to know my story. Hell, it might be the last one I ever tell. Double hell it might actually even help some poor soul out. I'm going to disappear after sending this. Hopefully the uh, good kind of disappearing, not the death kind. I know nobody but you is going to believe this story, but damn if typing this out didn't make my sorry ass feel better. You were right about that, man. I'm sorry for giving you shit for writing so much. T. And this is the attached file. Hide and seek. Now, before I get into the hiding and seeking, I have a bit of a confession that needs to be made. I work as a transporter for a deep web black market site. I hope it doesn't change your opinion of me too much. Sorry for not telling you sooner. I'm the guy they call in when they get an order for something they can't send through the mail. Guns and live animals are two good examples. You'd be pretty hyped to know how many rich assholes just order lions and tigers from the dark web. Well, for obvious reasons, I can't go into too much detail. I don't want to make too many dangerous enemies, and even after this, I still don't want to lose my job. It's a pretty sweet gig, all things considered. All I have to do is pick up from the seller and deliver to the buyer. I can even choose what jobs I want to take. Let's me cling to what little principles I still have. Oh, and I do have principles. After a few years of working for the signs, my two rules were no people and no crossing borders. Anyways, I got into a bit of a bind with the cryptocurrency crash that happened earlier this year. The site pays mostly in Bitcoin and, well, I decided to let my wallet sit and grow. By the time I realized what had happened, my savings were destroyed. Nobody expected it to crash that hard. And it probably wouldn't have been as much of a problem if I hadn't also gotten used to living a life full of, well, the finer things. I didn't really save all that much to begin with either. So when my savings finally ran dry and the market was still down, I decided to 
lower my standards a bit and take a riskier, higher paying job. Organ transport. I hadn't done it before and I hadn't been that broke in a long time. Organ jobs pay well too and I figured I still wasn't strictly breaking my no people rule if it was just their organs. So I hopped on the site and browsed through the pitiful number of requests in my area till I found what I was looking for. A rich buyer who had, well, shady connections, was in need of some organs and lacked either the time or patience to wait for them to come legally. As far as these sorts of requests went, this was pretty much the norm from what I'd heard. So I accepted the job and got an email with some additional details about the order. The customer needed two kidneys, which is what I was to transport, and a liver, which they'd made a separate request for. Now, from what other people on the side have told me, what should have happened was the job would move to the seeking seller section and I'd be on hold till someone acquired the kidneys. What actually happened probably should have tipped me off to use my monthly free withdrawal. I got a notification two hours later that there was a seller. Oh, Gento, I don't know how much you know about medicine, but if you do know anything, then you're probably squirming in your own skin about right now. now. For those who may or may not be reading this that are not in the know, not only do the donor and receiver have to be compatible blood types, but kidneys only last about a day outside a warm body. Not exactly a product you can stockpile. Well, I got another email about the pickup this time and began the internal debate between the bad feeling in my gut and my empty wallet. Well, you can probably guess which one of them won out. Anyways, I planned my route. One hour to get to the seller and four hours to get from there to the buyer. I sent the site my plan and within minutes they approved of it and set up an actual meeting point. I sighed and grabbed my things trying to swallow my nerves for the entire hour it took me to reach the meeting point. I sat down on a bench in a city park and waited for what seemed like ages before I felt someone staring at me. It took me a solid minute to pick out who it was, even though there were only a few people around. He was sitting with his back to me at a picnic table about ten yards away from me, and whenever I looked away, I could feel his eyes on me. When we eventually did make eye contact... He bounced excitedly in his seat and waved me over. My heart sank as he also slid a small case into my line of sight. I forced myself to smile, walked over, sat down and hid my annoyance. Most of the buyers on the site were practically carbon copies of each other, probably because you could only become a buyer if another buyer knew and endorsed you. The sellers, on the other hand, were all certifiably insane. None of the other transporters I'd chatted with had ever met a normal seller. And because of this, all of them quickly learned to keep conversation to a minimum and to not under any circumstances piss any of them off. I decided to follow in their example. The man sitting in front of me looked friendly enough. Overly so, if anything. He was scrawny. Didn't look like he'd be strong enough to, well, kill someone and harvest their insides. He had a strange smile on his face. Even now I can't get that out of my head. The kind of overly friendly, wide to smile that mothers warn their children to stay away from. Some I managed to be both inviting and creepy at the same time. I smiled and spoke up. So, um, you're the seller then? I asked, and the man nodded. He responded in a sickeningly sweet voice. He sounded like a child in a toy store. His voice strained with excitement and wonder as he droned on to his parents about what toys he wanted. Oh, I'm so glad you found me. For a minute there, I thought I'd have to call Oli Oli Oxenfree, he said with a pleased sigh, pushing the case to my side of the table. You know, over the years I've gotten quite good at playing hide-and-seek. So good, in fact, that I've never been found. Not even once. Oh, do you want to know my secret? The man asked his voice still just as unsettlingly sweet as his smile. Um, sure. What's your secret? I asked. I really, really didn't want to know what the hell he was talking about, but if it kept him happy then, well... He clapped rapidly and bounced in place. 
Oh, I'm so glad that you're a curious one. My secret is that the Seekers never know that they're playing. <laughs> Makes sense, I said, opening the case momentarily to verify. Two kidneys in pristine condition, doused with preserving fluid, wrapped in plastic, and packed in ice. Well, um, if the Seeker doesn't know they're playing, then, then how would they know to start looking? I said, leaving out the fact that it would just be stalking at that point, before swallowing hard, when I thought about where these kidneys had come from. <laughs> You're a smart one, he said, with a smile as I sent a message confirming the pickup. All that was left was to wait for the transaction to process. I was worried about this last one, though. Oh, she came right up to me. This close, he said, leaning in till our faces almost touched. I struggled to keep my composure. I managed to keep from jumping or pushing him away. So, what did you do? I asked as he leaned back, my suspicions about these kidneys being all but confirmed. Why, nothing of course, he said, a slightly bewildered expression on his face. He looks as though I'd just asked him how to breathe. I glanced down at my phone to see if the transaction had been verified yet, and he snapped his fingers like he remembered something. Oh, I must apologize, he said, making me look up. I forgot that you don't play much. I simply held my breath, closed my eyes, and wished that she would just go away. Hmm, you're right. You are good at hide and seek, I said, wishing to myself that he would just go away, and hearing the familiar ding of a successful transaction sound on both of our phones, as if to answer my prayers. I reached out my hand as a formality, and he grabbed it and shook it vigorously. I forced a smile and stood, although what he said next made my blood nearly freeze. Oh, you're the first person to find me in oh so long. He trailed off as he said it, his voice slowly shifting from that of an excited child to the cold-blooded maniac that he was. Maybe my games won't be so one-sided from now on, he said, his voice disturbingly normal. Although, even without looking back I could tell that the same sickeningly sweet smile was glued to his face. I kept walking but waved my arm as though saying goodbye. The worst part was that I could feel him watching me as I walked back to my car. Not just at first, like as if he was watching me leave, but the entire way back, and even as I got in my car. I took a moment to look around and sighed as I saw nothing. It might not sound like much to you, I don't know, and I could still hardly describe it myself, but he had this creepy way of getting under your skin just by talking to you. Well, I wrote it off as just me being paranoid. And the guy harvests organs from people for a living, so of course everything he says is creepy. I groaned and started my car, but it wasn't until I hit the freeway that I was able to finally shake the feeling of his gaze. Well, it's not like he could have been following me, but by then I was already paranoid enough to be checking for that, making a few detours just to be sure of it. And because of my detours... I ended up being about an hour past the scheduled drop-off with the buyer. Lost my chance for a tip, for sure. The guy was furious and there was nothing I could tell him to calm him down. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Oh, sorry I'm late, but the seller was a total psycho and I wanted to make sure he wasn't following me. Wouldn't have been a very good excuse. Whatever. I had my money and the buyer had his organs and plenty of time for whatever operation that used them. Not much to complain about on either side, well except for the fact that I already knew I wouldn't be sleeping that night. Especially because the feeling of being watched had returned as soon as I set foot out of my car, which was, again, impossible. The site never tells the sellers anything about the buyers or transporters, so there's no way he could have known where I was headed, and no way he could have followed me. I hopped back in my car and started to head for home, hoping that a few tabs of melatonin would be enough for at least a few hours of sleep. But again, I could feel eyes on me as I drove, and I saw his eerie smile everywhere until I hit the highway. I felt a weight lift off my shoulders then, 
Although I made sure to take the most winding path home that I could afford gas for, which was quite a bit after a job like that. Now, by the time I did get home, it was starting to get dark, and I had made a few loops around my apartment just to be sure I didn't still feel his eyes on me. Luckily, my apartment building has a public parking garage attached to it, so even if I was being followed, I felt safe enough that nobody would be able to find my room. Just to be sure. I took the stairs for the first time in months. Well, have any of you ever climbed seven flights of stairs out of paranoia before? Well, in case you haven't, let me tell you what it's like. Do you remember running up the stairs from the basement after turning off the lights as a kid? The feeling of unease and terror. Well, it's like that, but you aren't a kid anymore. It's not the dark or what imaginary monsters could be lurking in that that frightens you anymore. No, instead, you're worried about who could be hiding in the darkness. What real monster could be following you up those stairs? Now, I'm no slouch when it comes to exercise, but it still drained everything out of me, hauling my body up those stairs on my hands and feet like an animal as fast as I could. I got inside and locked the door securely behind me, panting, covered in sweat, but I sighed in relief with the fact that I hadn't felt anyone watching me at all during my climb. I took a moment to catch my breath, slumping down by the door and chuckling to myself while shaking my head. I couldn't believe I'd let that free get so deep under my skin. Once I caught my breath, I stood up and made my way to my couch before flopping onto it. I wanted nothing more than to go to sleep then and there. But I had to be smart with my money this time. I immediately cashed the bitcoin out. Better to pay myself out in small increments, but I had bills to pay, and I'd already learned my lesson about leaving things in Bitcoin. Once business was taken care of, I grabbed the remote control and flipped on the TV. The familiar faces of the local news anchors greeted me, and I began drifting off to sleep while listening to the happenings of our city. It was around 7am when I was woken up by the sound of the breaking news alert coming on. We were just receiving reports of a ghastly murder of one... Yeah. I'm not going to put her name or age here. College student living on her own. Police investigators say that several of her organs were found to be missing and they'd found evidence of someone living in her home without her knowledge for quite some time before the murder. The reporters kept talking about how much of a tragedy the situation was, but I wasn't listening. How could I listen? I've never been less happy to be right than I was at that moment. I shuddered thinking about it. My thoughts and paranoia regarding the man I'd met the other day bubbling back up to the surface. It was then that the reality of what I'd done hit me like a freight train. By accepting that contract, I doomed that girl to die. All because I needed some quick cash. I stood up and went to the kitchen and opened my liquor cabinet. Without looking, I grabbed a bottle of something with shaking hands and fumbled with the top while trying to keep my mind clear of thought. Once I had the cap off, I took several deep swigs from the bottle, spilling quite a bit down my chin before I set it down and gasped for air. The burn of the alcohol in my throat gave me something to focus on while it worked its magic on the rest of my body. As my mind slowly clouded, I found my way to a chair and found it easier to think about what had happened without panicking. My first thought was that I needed to do something. I knew the guy's face. I should go to the cops. It was at this moment that the uh, less impulsive side of my brain kicked in. I go to the cops and all I do is give myself a one-way ticket to an early grave. My employers don't take kindly to police interactions. I slowly resigned myself to the fact that I was going to have to live with the consequences of this job for the rest of my life. Yeah, I'm a coward, I know. Anyways, the next few days passed slowly. I was not in a good place mentally, and I'm sure you remember how much alcohol my cabinets were stocked with. I blacked out more than once, only to wake up gasping for breath from drinking too much. It was honestly a miracle that I didn't kill myself through alcohol poisoning. But I managed to come to terms with everything. Oh, don't get me wrong, I still had nightmares where I was the guy hiding in the girl's closet. But I wasn't drinking my problems away anymore. Although I think that that was more because of the fact I'd run out of liquor than any meaningful character development. It was about a week later when I was finally able to get my first night of actual sleep. I didn't dream about anything either, so that was a plus. 
I know it probably sounds bad, but I was starting to feel normal again, like I could maybe find a way just to be myself. Either way, even after all that, I still wanted to keep my job. I just added a new rule. No organs. From there, I fell back into more or less my old routine. I went out to eat almost every day, though. I thought any excuse that got me cleaned up and out of my place was worth taking. And then, I began to feel it again. That skin-crawling sensation of eyes on me from somewhere that I felt the day I met Mr. Hydens. I didn't think much of it at first. I only felt the eyes when I was surrounded by other people, so of course one or two would be looking my way, right? I thought I was just guilty and paranoid. But no matter what I did, I'd always feel like I was being watched whenever other people were around. So I started driving more and more and eating out less and less. Not driving anywhere in particular, just driving. I felt safe on the open road. I couldn't feel any eyes on me. Well, for about a week, that is. It started small. A shiver down my spine here and there. The sharp sensation that made my eyes snap to one car or another. Then it came more frequently, and I began to get more and more paranoid as the feeling became stronger and stronger. I started driving less and less, and whenever I did, I kept my eyes on the cars around me, trying desperately to find where that feeling was coming from, to find who was watching me, trying to catch a glimpse of his face in a passing car. I even thought I did see him a few times. Except that was just paranoia, my hope. Eventually, I stopped driving unless I had to. I shut myself in my apartment, only going out to get groceries and always, always making sure that I didn't feel anyone watching me before I parked. But that feeling would always find me whenever I went out. While well, this went on for about a month, I started to drink again. I didn't go out to eat or drive anymore. I paid someone to deliver my groceries to the garage of my building. All I did was eat, sleep, drink, and watch movies or play games. I'd be living the dream if I didn't think a serial killer was stalking. Part of me believed that I was just being paranoid, and to be honest, I desperately wanted to believe that part of me. But not enough to stake my life on it. And after another week of living like a shut-in, the feeling of being watched started to resurface. Like before, it started off small. I felt a ping of eyes on me, and from then on I kept the blinds securely closed. Even then, the feeling persisted for days, gradually gathering in strength. So I emptied out all my closets and cabinets daily. Eventually, I just left all of the doors open and everything on the floor, so I could look into any hiding spot in an instant. But that feeling still persisted. I stopped drinking because I was terrified of being attacked. I started sleeping less and less, and when I had to sleep, I slept inside of my closet and barred the door shut from the inside. I ate and drank only when I felt hungry, and always with my back to a corner of the room or locked in my closet. But I could still feel eyes on me, feel his eyes on me the same way I had back at the park. It was about a month later when I finally discovered my haven. The one place left I didn't feel watched. The stairwell of my building. I found that whenever I went down and back up the stairs to get my groceries, as I'd long since stopped using the elevator, then I would have a brief respite from the feeling of being watched. I started to spend all my waking hours there, sat on one of the stairs without a care in the world. I only left them to eat and sleep, and whenever I entered the building proper, I'd feel eyes on me almost immediately. But having those stairs to return to made my life almost bearable. It had been a long time since I'd had anywhere I felt safe, and, and like every place before it, I kept waiting for the feeling of being watched to follow me into the stairwell. But it never did. For another month, I fell into a somewhat bearable rhythm. I'd wake up in my closet feeling watched. I'd eat in the corner of my kitchen feeling watched. Then I scurry off to the stairwell where I could feel blessedly alone. Especially near the top floors where the stairs were seldom used. But all good things must come to an end and all that. And while I never did feel watched in the stairs, I did run out of money. 
Apartments and cars don't pay for themselves, after all. And while I managed a few months on the blood money from my last job, it was finally time to get back to work. In the months since I'd last logged onto the sites, things had calmed down significantly, and there were now plenty of jobs that didn't break any of my rules. So I decided to go with a route that I'd done before a couple of times. A gun run. The seller always treated me to a drink or two at his bar, I was also always well armed, so I felt that it would be a nice and easy job that I could feel safe doing. After confirming the job, I closed my laptop, pulled on a fresh set of clothing, and headed out the door. I wanted to get this over and done with, and thankfully the feeling of being watched was rather light that day. I do admit, however, that I lingered in the stairwell for a bit before heading out. I wanted a bit of time alone before being out in the open for the first time in months. Anyways, I hopped in my car after about 30 minutes of blessed stairwell time and headed to the bar. After about two hours of paranoid and twisting driving, I managed to make it just in time and pulled my car into the alleyway behind the bar. The owner greeted me with a smile as I got out. T, long time no see, he said, his smile fading as I walked up and he got a better look at me. Holy shit, man, you feeling okay? He asked, genuine worry in the eyes of this large man. No, I'm pretty far from okay, I said with an exhausted sigh. I could still feel the faintest hint of eyes on me even now, though I know that the owner wouldn't let me be jumped at his bar. It's a long story, I offered, realizing for the first time that it might be nice to actually tell someone what had happened. Ah, is that so? He said with a hint of a smile and a shake of his head. Well, how's about we get you a drink while the boys get ready to load up your car? He offered in return, making me smile. There's always plenty of time for stories of my bar, he said proudly. Oh, I'd like that, I said with another exhausted sigh, managing to keep the smile up as he put an arm around me and led me in the back door of the bar. Oh, by the way, how'd you hold up during the Bitcoin crash? Heard it hit a couple of transporters pretty hard, he said, making me chuckle as we made our way through the kitchen. <sighs> Funny you should mention that, I said, making him raise an eyebrow. Because that's how my long story st I began, only to stop short when I looked at the bar. He was sitting there, sipping on a beer without a care in the world. He noticed me out of the corner of his eye same sickeningly sweet smile crept onto his face as his eyes met mine. I froze. There was no way that this was a coincidence. There was no way that he just happened to be at this bar at this time. I was broken from my trance by the bar owner, waving his hand in front of my face and saying my name. Hello? Gee, you alright? I quickly ducked back into the kitchen and started to hyperventilate. How did he know? How could he have possibly known that I'd be here? Did he follow me? Did who follow you? The owner's voice brought me back to reality once again as I realized I'd been thinking out loud. His face was concerned, bordering on scared. How long has that guy been at the bar? I asked, hoping that the owner knew who I was talking about. Oh, if you mean tall, thin, and creepy, then about an hour. <laughs> What's going on, T? He asked as I slumped against the wall. I started crying. I broke down and burst back into the bar only to see that Mr. Hyden C was already gone. Oh, I need to go. I need to get home, I said, pushing past the owner and running to my car. He called after me, trying to get me to stay and explain what the hell was happening, but I wasn't listening. For all I know, Mr. Hyden C could be breaking into my apartment already. I drove straight home and threw open the door to my apartment. It had still been locked, but I wasn't taking any chances. I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and checked everywhere. But he wasn't there. And then my phone rang and scared the living hell out of me. I checked the number and gulped when I saw it was blocked. I considered not answering it, but in the end, I picked up the call. Uh, hello? I asked tentatively. Gee, what the hell happened at the bar? A modulated voice rang through the speaker in my ear, making me wince. 
was one of the site admins for sure. I was silent for a moment before telling the admin everything. I couldn't see the man, but I could feel a sudden change when I mentioned seeing Mr. Hyden's seat at the bar. T, the admin began, a serious edge to his voice. I need you to log into the site now, he said, and something in me told me to listen. I booted up my laptop and hopped onto the site. As soon as I logged in, a dialogue appeared that I'd never seen before. Admin would like to take control of this computer. Do you consent to this? With two buttons. One for yes, one for no. I clicked yes and watched as my cursor began to move on its own. Thank you, T. This will only take a moment, the admin said. A practice calm in his voice as he downloaded several files and began to do something on my laptop. A minute later, a dialogue box popped up that said, Threat detected. And the admin sighed and his voice sharpened as he spoke. T, you've been compromised. You've had a nasty piece of spyware installed on your machine for about a month by the looks of things. It's been recording your keystrokes and giving someone remote access to your camera. The admin explained, making me gulp as I realized that all of my information was insecure. But <laughs> there's no way I haven't downloaded anything, I said, making the admin mutter something as a bout of typing could be heard coming through the phone. The admin's voice was cold and calculated when he spoke next. No, no, you didn't, he said, making me gulp. This software was installed via USB, the admin said, making my heart nearly stop. Hide and seek had been in my home. He'd been here without me noticing and put that program on my laptop. Even after all of my paranoia, he still found his way into my room without me knowing. But I'm going to delete the program, the admin said. And a few keystrokes later, done. What the... As the admin deleted the program, thousands of windows began popping up on the screen of my laptop. All of them saying the same thing. Ollie, Ollie, oxen free. After that, I threw my laptop in the trash and got a new one, as well as a new phone, SIM card and all. I was taking no chances. I got all new accounts for everything, and the admin told me he'd revoke Mr. Hide and Seek's membership personally. But, well, I'm going to disappear all the same. I have a plane ticket to somewhere, and my bags are already packed. Don't look for me. And if you ever start to feel like you're being watched, it's because you are. So finally we're back to the deep web. I haven't done a deep web story in a long, long time. I guess it was kind of a fad. The time seems to have passed, but they're always a lot of fun if you approach them as just stories. I mean, no other kind of story gets as many comments say, oh, the deep web's nothing like this. Oh, no, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. It's just a story. It's just meant to be a bit of fun. Might not be realistic, but it doesn't really matter, does it? We're all here just to listen to a story and have a bit of fun before we go to bed. <laughs> or whatever you want to do, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, nice one there. Um, well, back again very soon. Hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, doing something different next time. Got some longer stories lined up for you. Hour plus stories. Two hours maybe sometimes. Even more. Oh my god. Well, a lot lined up for you. Hope you're going to join me again very soon. Say you will, please. Go on. All right. Till next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, you want to know more about me? I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, 
I hope to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.